about the money. It's not about the fame. It's all about how you play the game. I'm just so glad today to have with me another Bob. My name's Robert, and so I always get a kick out of meeting other Roberts, Bobs, Bobbies, and Robs, however you want to say it. And so I, I just love that. I'm the third, and so my dad is Robert, and my grandfather's Robert, and wouldn't you know it, I named my son Robert as well. So, uh, you know, I, I probably have a special affinity for that. But today we've got with us Bob Berg, who is the author or the co-author of The Go-Giver and also the author of a new book called Adversaries to allies, adversaries into allies, winning people over without manipulation or coercion. Now, I don't know about you, but I was at a point in my life where I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to be on my side. And, you know, then, of course, you get into the job market and it gets a little bit harder. You you, you want people to agree with you. You want people to um, help come to your side of the fence so that you can kind of move towards your goals or complete projects, etc. And that becomes challenging. And then I got married and it became even more challenging. So uh, Bob's book, of course, is something that really hits home and something that really brings to most of us um, the ideas of, you know, how to really get along and how to win people over. So I'll let him take the lead on really talking about that. But first, I've been talking all this time, and I have not even said, hello, Bob, how are you doing today? Hi, Robert. Great to speak with another Robert, Bob, Bobby, Rob, what have you. <laughs> yes. Certainly uh, enough of us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I always um, look back at the the meanings of names, and so I, I, I always get a kick out of the fact that the name Robert means bright or fame as well. So uh, it's... It's a privilege to be in the, the presence of more fame here. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Good deal. So, you know, the, the idea here is what success looks like. We really want to look at stories of people and how they reached from one point to the other, what they view success as, and, and tell, talk to us a little bit about their journey. And then in that, we want to incorporate some of your book here. So why don't you tell us a little bit, first of all, of maybe your beginnings, where you came from, and how you got from where you started to where you are now. Well, career-wise, began as a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I started in radio and then w was in television news. I wanted to be in, in television sports, but news is where it opened up, and, right. and that's what I what I went with. I was with a, a small ABC affiliate in the Midwest and mm -hmm. uh, worked my way up to uh, late-night news anchor. I wasn't particularly good at it. I mean, I could read the news, but I wasn't a journalist by right, any means. Right. And at 24 years old, I really didn't care. Uh, so I, I very quickly found myself not in the news business, and I graduated into sales. Mm -hmm. And while I intuitively knew that selling was about finding a, finding a need and serving it, uh, I, I didn't have the skill set. You know, I had the motivation, but I didn't have the information. Wow. So. Uh, Fortunately, I was in a bookstore and saw a, a book with the title uh, "How to Master the Art of Selling" by Tom Hopkins, which of course is a classic in the in the genre. And that right there gave me a lot of hope. And just knowing there was a system of some sorts—I mean, how to master the art of selling—I never realized there was an art to it. I thought right. you just went out there and you tried to help people, and that was it. But uh, there is an art to it. There's an art and a science. So I quickly, after devouring his book. I quickly began to really increase my sales and had a lot more fun with it. I then began a journey of learning about sales. I'd study Zig Ziglar and all the greats of the time and I'd go to seminars whenever I could. Really in a very quick period of time my sales went through the roof Wow! Uh, only because I now had a system that I could follow and I, I define a system as the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. key, Robert, is predictability. Right. If right. it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired result of B, then you know that all you need to do is A, and continue to do A, and you'll get the desired results of B. And so once I was able to do that, now that really changed a lot of things because I saw that if I could do that for sales, I could pretty much do that for, for anything. Right. right. 
Yeah, so eventually I began showing others how to do the same thing and it, it sort of morphed into a speaking business. And of course I knew nothing about the speaking business so I joined National Speakers Association where there were people there who'd been there, done that, they had the system for developing a speaking business right, and right. I started to plug into that and learn and now I've been doing this for upwards of 25 years. Awesome, awesome. That's, so you uh, wrote this book here about um, you know winning people over, and so uh, ultimately that does really talk about sales. But how does that translate into maybe the personal environment, not just about selling a product? Well, you know what 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 do you address here in the personal environment? Well, it's interesting. Most of the book is not about selling or selling situations itself, other than, you know, we're always selling in terms of an idea. Uh, it could be a product, a service, could be an idea, could be a philosophy, could be a concept, could be on anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but it's, it's in this book, although I have certain examples from, from selling, it, it's really not a sales book. It's really for, for really anyone who needs to, and uh, who needs to be able to influence others and really influences what? It's moving people or people to a to an appropriate and a desired action. Right. And what I call ultimate influence, which I talk about throughout the book, yeah. ultimate yeah. influence to me is getting the results you want when dealing with people, including the difficult people we sometimes have to deal with, but in such a way that we help this person really genuinely feel good about themselves about the situation and about us because that's really when it comes right down to it the only way you can really have both short-term and long-term influence yeah so you you talk about one of the parts that i liked when i read i was reading in the beginning it kind of really hit home with me you talked about the emotion and you started talking about rationalize versus truth <laughs> you know talk to me a little bit about the whole rationalize and truth um concept oh. No, well, just as human beings, we are emotional creatures. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're logical to a certain point, but we're really emotional. I mean, we make decisions based on emotion. We back up those emotional decisions with logic right. or rationalization. If you take the word rationalize and, and break it in two, it simply means we tell ourselves rational lies right. in order to justify the emotional decision that we made because right. we do make decisions typically based on that. Now, when I talked about truths, I talked about the, the truths in terms of beliefs. You know, what is a belief? It's a subjective truth. It's the truth as we right. understand yeah. the truth to be. And we know this is, is something that's very realistic because we've all heard the stories of five people witnessing a, a car accident from the, pretty much the same angle, the same accident. They all have five totally different stories. Right. But there is one objective truth. What happened happened how we see it, we filter through our own belief system, which is why we often make major decisions based on very limited information. We fill in the blanks based on how we believe the world is. Right. And that belief system was handed to us uh, first by our parents, and then society, and school, and news media, and television shows, and movies, and cultural mores, and everything we touch, taste, smell, see, hear, and all the different things. We don't even, we're not even aware right. that our operating system, that which runs us, is based on a bunch of beliefs that we had nothing to do with forming. Right. And neither does the other person believe that they're operating from their own set of belief systems. Right. And so that's really, that's why I say principle number two is to understand the clash of belief systems. It's understanding, we don't need to understand that person's belief system necessarily, we just simply need to understand that their belief system is most likely a lot different from our belief system. And right, once right. we, when we, not, when we understand that, now we're, we're putting ourselves in an environment where we can work within that context for everyone's benefit. Right. So you, you've mentioned two, two principles so far with regard to your emotions, number one. And number two, you're talking about uh, belief systems, understanding mm -hmm. those. T talk to us about the other three. Um, you know, ego was one of them. Go, go ahead and take us through those. Well, we need to acknowledge that other person's ego. Uh, ego is that sense of I. It's that identification that we have with, our, uh, with ourselves that we're unique, separate individuals. and We all pursue our happiness in our own way. Mm -hmm. uh, based on what we value to be happiness, but what happens is the ego, that it's fine. It, the, when we control our ego, uh, we can utilize it to accomplish great things that serve both us and society. 
It's when the ego gets away from us, when the ego controls us, that we tend to do counterproductive things. Now, we obviously need to acknowledge our own ego and make sure we have a check on our own ego. But the other person, we need to acknowledge their ego as well. Now, when I say acknowledge their ego, I don't mean to say to the person, hey, buddy, you know, you're acting out of your ego. No, <laughs> that's the opposite of that. What I mean is to acknowledge in our mind that if they are acting in a way that really doesn't serve uh, the correct purpose and really isn't productive, there's a good chance their ego is at work. They're not thinking logically. They're going to really, their emotions are controlling them, and we need to acknowledge that. We need to know that in any interpersonal situation that's uncomfortable or, or, or not productive, there's a good chance that that other person's ego is at work. So we need to, to be aware of that. Right, right, right. So that's number three. What's number four? Number four is to set the proper frame. Well, what is a frame? Well, a frame is really the foundation from which everything else uh, evolves. Uh, example. Uh, I was in a Dunkin' Donuts restaurant right, uh, okay. store, Dunkin' Donuts store, and there was a little boy, two years old, maybe a little older. He was a toddler, and he was walking across the store toward his parents when all of a sudden he fell. He, he took a spill, and it, he wasn't hurt, but you could tell that he intuitively understood that wasn't supposed to happen. Right, and right. immediately he looked at his mom and dad for their interpretation of the event. Now, the event was what it was. But he was looking at them to see what he should make out of it. Now, I really believe, Robert, that had his parents, you know, panicked and gone, oh, no, no, my poor baby, you must be so hurt. we got to get you to a hospital. Right? He would have gotten very upset and probably started crying. But the parents handled it beautifully. You know, they kind of clapped and they went, oh, that's so fun. That's such a good job. And, you know, he immediately, well, he started giggling and laughing and enjoying it. Yeah. What the parents did is they set a very productive frame right, for their right. son. So everything from there was positive. Now, we can set a frame in a conversation when we go in with a genuine smile and a good morning and, and our body language says that we're looking to, to have a frame of friendship and, and congruence and working together. What we need to do, though, also, along with set the frame, is be ready to reset another person's negative frame. Uh -huh. Because if they already come into it with a negative view or a, a win-lose kind of view, or, you know, I, I use the example in the book. I tell the story about the time I almost, uh, when I was driving, I was pulling into a parking lot, into a parking space, and I uh, almost hit a guy who was coming out the driver's side of his car. And, he, you know, he was taken aback. He was scared and he was angry. He was very reactionary. And he uh, gave me a really nasty look. Yeah. Now, had I reacted to that, let my emotions control me, and had I bought into his frame, I might have went, what are you looking at? He'd have said, watch where you're going or not. Right? And at best, it would have been uncomfortable. At worst, it would have been a... a potentially nasty situation. But instead what I did is I reset the frame. I, I just put a smile, an apologetic smile on my face. I put my hand up in the air and I went, sorry. And he immediately went, no problem. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's very it's simple to do. Most people are going to react to what we do. And so we can easily reset that, that frame. In any potentially difficult interpersonal situation, we need to realize that a frame will be set. Right, the only right. question is, who's going to set the frame? You or the other person? And if you let them set the frame, you're depending on luck that this person understands what a frame is and that they're going to consciously be thinking about it. No, it's right, not going right. to happen. We need to be the one that, that takes responsibility for making sure that the best frame is set. So you, before we go into principle number five, then you mentioned that there is one question that you can ask that's pretty much guaranteed to keep any misunderstandings from ever actually taking place. Well, what is that question? Yeah, in a sense, this goes back to belief systems because, uh, you know, we can somebody can say a word or use a term and we all interpret it based on our own belief system. So let's say uh, you're in uh, doing a joint venture with someone and that person says, well, I really think we need to have this, this project completed right away. What does right away mean? Right, if there's right. four of you, one's thinking that means tonight, so, you may, so you're going to not go to the ball game you're going to go to. Another person thinks it's next week, which means that they can plan on this or that. The other person's thinking next month right away means different things depending upon who says it. So the actual question you know, would be uh, you know, to ask, well, when you say right away, 
you know, how would you define that or what exactly do you mean? Are you thinking of a, a specific day? Now, the way you would frame it is with, with tact and kindness so the person's not defensive rather than saying, well, what do you mean by right away? I don't even know what you mean by right away. That's, that's going to have the opposite effect. Instead, what you might say is, uh, Dave or Mary, just for my own clarification, when you say right away, is there a specific date you're thinking of? Yeah. So yeah. now, you, without making that person defensive and resistant, you've been able to clarify and, and, and have him clarify exactly what he means by right away. Right, right. So in principle number five, you have or you listed, there's a word in the principle itself that you uh, listed as the most powerful word in the English language. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, that word is tact. T-A-C-T, <laughs> my favorite four-letter word in the English language. And that's simply, you know, my dad has always defined tact as the language of strength. Right, right. And I so agree with that, Robert, because tact is really a way of of teaching someone. It's, it's correcting or critiquing or, dare I be a bit politically incorrect, and I say constructively criticizing someone. Right, right. And, you know, we don't like to use those words, and we don't like to do any of those things. But, hey, we're talking about the real world. And there are times we need to be able to bring a mistake to someone's attention. Right, uh, right. The person overpaid on a negotiable product or they gave some wrong information, incorrect information to a customer or they were speaking disrespectfully to somebody. And we need to be able to bring this up in a way that not only is the person not defensive and resistant to us and to our idea, but they embrace it. Right, right. And we can only do that with tact and empathy when we can really put ourselves in this person's shoes and and speak in a way that's respectful and kind. And throughout the book, I provide different scenarios in the form of very short stories that we can put ourselves into so that after we talk about the five principles, people can really easily grasp how right. to speak to people in a way that really not only brings out their own best, but brings out the best in those they speak with. Right. So you've got these things written down. And so I, I've read books before. And as you read the books, it's kind of like a story. OK, so you see these words on the paper and yeah, that looks like it would work really well. But then you get out of the book and, and real life happens. Right. So let's say that you're in a situation where it's just, gosh, really emotionally charged. OK, and you, you're not even thinking about these principles at that point. In an emotionally charged situation, what do you suggest to people to still, um, I don't want to say win over the other person, but really, I guess, get the point across and really deal with the situation productively? Sure. Well, first, remember, when we talk about emotions, the, the, the principle is uh, control your own emotions. Right. That's key. Now, because if our emotions are controlling us, we're not in a a context where we can ever um, influence another person. Okay, so what I suggest for people who who that tends to be their default system, you know, that their the, their default mode uh, when people they allow people to upset them. Say, you know, no one can upset us, no one can make us mad, no one can make us angry, but they can certainly push our buttons. Right that cause us to make ourselves angry, and that's life, okay? So if we know this is the case, Robert, and we know that that uh, that, that losing our, our emotional grasp is a challenge for us, I suggest rehearsing in advance. Ah. This is so important, and I talk about this in the book. Think of an astronaut. Before they go up into space, where a hundred things could go wrong, that could be life or death, okay? They simulate the missions hundreds and hundreds of times. So by the time they get up there, even though it's certainly still real world and it's different, mm -hmm. they rehearsed it so often that when it happens, hey, I've been there, I've done that. You know, you see a, a quarterback uh, hit a, a receiver perfectly and the timing's perfect, like they've read each other's mind. No, they rehearsed the pattern uh, a thousand times. You right. know what I'm saying? And, so, and that's what we want to do. So yeah, yeah. picture yourself in a situation. First, we need to understand why it's important to, as Zig Ziglar would say, respond rather than react. Then we need to train ourselves to do this. How? By picturing situations that have come up in the past or that could come up in the future where, so, where our buttons are pushed and where we're most likely to be in a situation right, uh, right. where that could happen. And then run through in your mind, simulate like an astronaut simulates their mission 
simulate exactly how you're going to respond. And I give you ways in the book mm -hmm. to be able to really work within that other person's frame, within their ego, within the, and so forth. And so, so utilize that and then practice it in advance. And then when, you, when it happens and you handle it beautifully, take pleasure in it. Yes. Now, yes. If you mess up, well, you know you're human. We all are. We all mess up from time to time. But when we really take these, these principles and put them into play, it's going to happen a lot less than it ever did. And our influence is going to go through the roof. Right. So a lot of people are going to see this book um, and they're going to look at the section that says win people over. And immediately, maybe the thought process that comes in is, uh, oh, I've got an opinion. I need to get everybody on my side yeah. of the fence. Everybody to agree with me because I'm right. And I need to get everybody to see that I'm right. What's the difference between winning somebody over and uh, influence, as you just mentioned? Well, influence really is winning someone over. I think the big difference is between persuasion and manipulation. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, manipulation is a very negative thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Sweats, who wrote a great book back in 1987 called uh, The Art of Talking So That People Will Listen, which was really more about listening right. than talking. A great book, wonderful book. And I remember he said, and I, and I quote him in, in, in my book, that uh, manipulation aims at control not cooperation. It does not consider the good of the other party. It results in a win-lose. You know, this is the person who feels, I'm right, and I don't care what they think, they're good, right? And they'll say and do anything they have to, whether it's lying or forcing or whatever. Now, the persuader, on the other hand, always seeks to enhance the self-esteem of the other party. The result is people respond better because they're treated as responsible, a response able, right. self directing individual. So the difference really between uh, manipulation or coercion or or force or you know and and persuasion, which is the good form of influence, the positive form of influence, it begins with intent, benevolent intent. But what happens is while both the manipulator and the persuader can get instant results at times. Mm -hmm. Only the persuader can get long-term results because right, right. once somebody does something because they feel they were manipulated, they're going to resent that person. They're going to be prepared for that person. They're going to resist that person. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's wrap up with one more question here, and we asked this at the end of, of every show. What does success look like to you? And I know that that might be in the frame of your book here and relationships. What, what, what does success look like for you? Well, in, you know, success is very much a matter of context mm -hmm. because success can be as simple as winning a ball game. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you know, the, the four to three, the team that that won won. They were successful. The other team was not successful in in the the game in terms of was not successful uh, in terms of the uh, game itself. But maybe they were successful in terms of doing better than they did before. Right. Uh, it could be you know you want to lose twenty pounds. Uh, if you in in five months, if you do it, you were successful in terms of accomplishing the goal. If you lost, you know, five pounds, you were somewhat successful, but not totally successful. Right, so that's right. one form of success. But success on a on a broader scale, I think, is more a, a feeling of genuine happiness and peace of mind, right, right. based on having done one's best in living up to their potential. Yes. And to the degree that we live up to our potential, that's the degree to which we're successful. That's my definition of success. But again, it takes many different different uh, frames, different, many different uh, ways. Okay. So tell us two, two last things. The first thing is, for everybody that reads Adversaries to Allies, what's the one big thing that you want them to take away from this? Probably that, that people are not going to do things for your reasons, mm -hmm. they're going to do things for their reasons. So what you need to do is tie your reasons or tie what you want to have happen in with what they would like to have happen. So you've always got to have them in mind. Ultimately, when it comes to influence and persuasion, it's not about you. Yeah, It's about the other person. Okay, so you've okay. got to always keep in mind their wants, their needs, their desires, their goals, their values. Okay. So is it on the market yet? Where can they get it? How can they grab a copy? 
Yeah, it just came out a few weeks ago. It's selling very well already, so we're quite pleased. They can go to Berg, B-U-R-G dot com, and they can, uh, there's a graphic on the right-hand side of the page. They can click on that so that they can they get chapter one of the book first to see if they like it and like where it's going. And then if they enjoy that, they can either go to their local bookseller or click right through to Amazon.com or one of the other online booksellers. Awesome. And so if they go to Berg.com, they can see your calendar, where you're speaking, and all of that as well? Um, uh, yeah, if they go up to so – I don't have my um, uh, corporate – events there, but we have our public events that are listed in one of the links. So they can also ch uh, connect with me on social media, awesome. they can subscribe to my blog, and there's a whole bunch of other goodies there. Awesome. Well, Bob, it's been great chatting with you. I really appreciate the time here. Uh, and for those of you that, that are out there, if I haven't said it enough, I'll say it again. Go out and grab a copy of Adversaries to Allies. You know, the thing that one of my coaches taught me was that leaders are readers so make sure that you are growing every day and this is one of the ways that you grow as you move towards success in your life just make sure that you take advantage of every moment i say be bold be exceptional and remember that each moment is just an opportunity for you to create something new in your life today this has been what success looks like thanks for joining us Hi there, I'm so glad that you were able to join me today. I wanna to talk to you about one thing really quickly. A lot of us have goals, a lot of us have dreams, a lot of us have things that we want to achieve. And the reason that we can't achieve them is due to one thing. That one thing is fear. Fear is the barrier that stands in between where you are now and greatness. Fear is the obstacle that you've gotta overcome in order to get to your success. And I wanna be able to help you do that. So I've put together a book called 28 Days to a New Me, A Journey of Commitment that just came out and you can grab that for your Kindle or for your Nook on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. 28 Days to a New Me is about creating powerful transformations that'll change your life. It's about redefining commitment. It's about being bold and being exceptional. Go online to amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com, grab a copy and see how you can change your life.